Hi, everybody. So, let's see. There we go. Okay, so Zappo. Zappo was founded in uh, 2013 by Wences Cazares. Uh, Wences' background is 20 years in financial services, financial technologies from Argentina, and he founded what became the E-Trade of Latin America back in the early 90s and sold that to Banco Santander, and then he founded uh, uh, Banco Lemon, which was sold to Banco de Brazil. He then pioneered a, a company in the NFC payment space and then uh, a mobile wallet. He was introduced to Bitcoin in 2011, and he began mining for, for himself and began buying Bitcoin for his own account. And he needed a place to keep it, so he had his dev team, all of whom have been with him a decade or more, uh, build a cold storage solution. And, and that cold storage solution was the beginning of, of Zappo, and it really remains the, the core of the company. Um, we're fortunate to, to have uh, pretty much everybody on the senior team with, with over a decade, sometimes two decades of experience in financial services and financial technology. We think that's uh, important for the future of the company going forward and, and it's a boon to our, to our clients. Um, we have great investors. We're, we're blessed with uh, great investors, some of whom are in the room and at this conference, but uh, Benchmark led our first round, Greylock led the second. Index Ventures, Ribbit, Fortress, um, it's, it's a great list and they're very value added. So that's kind of who we are. What we do, uh, sorry. So what Zappo is, is, is really a, a platform, a universal platform for Bitcoin. Uh, and two, two businesses reside on top of that. One is the consumer business. We provide retail Bitcoin services for consumers. And the institution side of the business is primar primarily custodianship. So we securely store Bitcoin both for consumers and institutions, but with institutions we provide management tools for corporate treasury and um, private client services and, and, and the like. On the consumer side, we have a debit card connected to the, to the hosted wallet, and I'll talk more about that in a second. So... If you, if you want to know who Zappo is, our DNA, and who we are at core, it's, it's, it's security and it's our vault. Our, our philosophy is a little bit different than, than some people in the, in the security field, um, at least in the enterprise security field in Bitcoin. And we're animated by the fact, we're guided by the philosophy that private keys should never touch the internet, period. Not at the creation of a multi-sig wallet, not when a transaction is signed, never, not once. So what we do is we bring the transaction to cold storage, not the other way around. And what we've done is we have five different cold storage vaults, uh, each with master private keys in them, in four different continents. And in order to withdraw Bitcoins from the vault, when you, when you send Bitcoins to our vaults on a multi-sig address, in order to withdraw Bitcoins from the vault, you need three of those five uh, cold servers to sign the transaction. And so basically, We've combined deep cold storage and multi-sig to, to create what we think is the, the safest place to keep your Bitcoin. I, there's different use cases for different types of storage, but we believe that this is the baseline. If you absolutely must know that your keys will be safe, if you have a fiduciary duty, if you have a very large store of, of coins you keep for, for other people, for investors, we believe this is a solution. Now, the reason that we go to such great lengths on physical security, this is a picture of our cold storage vault in Switzerland. It's the only place we publicly announce where a vault is. It's in a former military installation. It was built to withstand nuclear war. Um, there's all sorts of physical, biometric, and um, other types of security inside there. The reason that's so important and why it seems we kind of go over the top there is that because that's where the private keys are, physical security is extraordinarily important. Um, and frankly, if we only had one of those vaults, that's too big a risk. That's why we have multiple vaults and we use multi-sig to, to withdraw uh, Bitcoin from, from our vault. Uh, we announced this week that uh, we're using satellite to, to help us monitor our system. So basically, we keep what you might think of as an x-ray or fingerprint of our system that is checked against our system um, multiple times. And if something's different, uh, then we know something's wrong and we freeze everything. We've passed a SOC 2 audit, so our entire processes, our security processes have been audited. SOC 2 is about uh, a third-party validation of your security processes. We've got also undergone penetration testing, uh, MDSEC. 
Okay, so the topic of this conversation is not an advertisement for Zappos, so I kind of apologize for that. Uh, this is supposed to be bridging past and future payment systems. And, and this slide is one way that I actually think about explaining Bitcoin to people. Like, there's so many different ways to explain, ex explain Bitcoin, it's tough. But one way I ex explain Bitcoin is just a continuation of the disintermediation that started in the mid-90s. Uh, disintermediation that, that took down the post office, that took down uh, brick and mortar stores. We went from, uh, let's take film, we went from movie theaters to mom and pop DVD shops to Blockbuster to e-commerce with Amazon to Netflix. And that's continuing, it's taking two decades. So anything that's been digitized, the, in, the intermediaries involved, it's a matter of time before they're gone, okay? But that hasn't happened in money. And that's strange because money's been digital for a very long time. We have uh, D. Hawk, who was the founder of Visa on our, on our advisory board. And that was, you know, he founded Visa in like 1970. And yet all these intermediaries remain that we deal with to our frustration many times uh, in both the card networks and also banks. And, and actually the names are all the same. The last 40, 50 years, they're all the same same uh, companies. And the reason they haven't been disintermediated is that they've been necessary essentially to, to prevent fraud. It's a double spend problem, right? So Satoshi's beautiful invention was the death knell for, for these intermediaries. Now, I'm not saying proclaiming that banks and credit card companies are going away. They could adopt Bitcoin and they could adjust just like AT&T and people who relied on long distance adjusted to the internet and made businesses out of it. But the truth is the singular purpose that they've existed for for so long and resisted disintermediation no longer exists. There is no double spend problem anymore. There is no fraud problem anymore. So this, this legacy complexity of a credit card transaction, but I could also put an ACH transaction up there, an international wire, a SWIFT, whatever. This incredible complexity that's built up over time not just because of, of the fraud issue and having to, to have trusted intermediaries there, but because they were patchwork systems that came together before the internet. So you had this incredible complexity with different parties and different tolls at every point. This is the past, right? And this is the future. I mean, if there was, if there was one slide, that I, I don't really need any slides for this presentation, it's that, right? And when people, when critics, and they're, they're legion, right? And they come at you from every direction. When they talk to me about like, well, what about this and what about that law and what about this regulation and what about that? And I, you know, you can engage in that. It's kind of an interesting discussion. But at the end of the day, they're betting on this and I'm betting on that, you know? I'll take that all day long. It's just a question of time. It might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, it might take five, but it's just a question of time. So what are our challenges of getting to that point? I, I went to a payments boot camp. There's this consultancy in Menlo Park in Silicon Valley that they're great. They're called uh, Glenbrook, Glenbrook Payments. And payments is a complicated subject. So a few years ago, I went to a seminar there, and they keep up on all the innovations in payments and, and banking and the like. And they give a full day seminar. It's like 90 slides and interactive and stuff like that. And they posted natural laws of payments. And at that time, by the way, in 2012, Bitcoin was like half a page, maybe three bullet points of a 90-page slide. I, I bet it's different now. Um, but a lot of these still apply and, and are things that we have to deal with. So bridging past to future. When you're talking about merchants who are kind of one side of Bitcoin as, as a method of transaction, we talk a lot about saving money. And that's important. But the truth is that adoption of innovations and payments isn't driven by saving money. It's much more driven by increased revenue, by incremental revenue. What, what merchants care about is, are you bringing me new customers that are buying who otherwise wouldn't be? That's what they care about. I can't explain why that is. I think it's because incremental revenue represents growth and saving on costs represents you know, better cash flow, but it's not, it's not the same as growing your business. Um, convenience drive cha drives change, we know that. Bitcoin is still way too inconvenient. You know, we'll solve it, we'll get there, but it's very hard to buy Bitcoin. 
Um, it's not easy enough for my mother-in-law to pick it up and use it. That's my test, you know? Um, and in some ways, we're going in the opposite direction. If, if she were sitting in this, in this auditorium the last two days, and, and I believe me, we're discussing very, very important topics, as I'll mention in a moment. I'm not putting it down. But for the average person who's not an insider like us, she would basically tell my wife to divorce me or force me to quit the Bitcoin industry. I mean, she, this is so far over the head of the average consumer that we have to reach in order to, to have Bitcoin, Bitcoin go mainstream that, you know, we, we've got a long way to go. So it's not convenient enough. Some other stuff there that is probably worth pointing out. Security is table stakes. So I mentioned that Zappos' priority is security. What we really want to get to is a place where security is no longer the topic of discussion with Bitcoin. If we're engaging with people about Bitcoin and what we're talking about primarily is security, we're, we're in trouble, right? That has to be a given. It has to be a given. Um, chicken and egg, that's what we're dealing with right now in, 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 this, in Bitcoin as a, as a payment method of transaction. Coinbase, BitPay, BitNet, GoCoin, they're all doing a great job of getting merchants on board. And at the same time, we're seeing cons consumer adoption. But the twain have not met so much yet. You know, I think that will happen, and it's, it's because of the network effect. We get, we get reports um, every day. Of, uh, of user growth, at least as this data science firm sees it in, uh, on the Bitcoin network. And the growth has stayed very much the same regardless of price or anything else. So the network effect will happen where Bitcoin will become so ubiquitous, enough merchants are on one side, enough consumers on the other, that it becomes a real method of transaction, but we're not there yet. So one of the things you, that, that's happened in previous episodes and examples of disintermediation is that you don't go from point A to point Z immediately. What you have for a long period of time is a hybrid, right? So again, back to the, to the film example, it's like the internet was used by Amazon uh, to make their logistics more efficient, you know, to be a better e-commerce company. Before we ever got to Netflix and pure streaming, you know, there was this combination of brick and mortar and warehouses and delivery trucks, as well as, as internet and, and efficiencies that came from it. That's kind of what we're going to see for a while in Bitcoin as well. So I, it's not just the debit card, which I'll talk about in a second, that's kind of a bridge between past and future. It's also, I really like what Circle's done with their wallet, um, even though it's a competitor theoretically. Coinbase, same thing. They, they've almost, um, when you go in there, you don't think so much am I dealing with Bitcoin because you have a USD and Bitcoin balance in it and you choose whatever works for you. That's a really nice incremental step towards convenience and, and kind of um, going from the past to the future. So with the debit card, this is how a typical debit card tr transaction works. You have five parties involved at least, and approval's gotta take, it's gotta go back and forth in under three seconds or the transaction times out. With Zappo, this thing is tough, okay? If it wasn't tough, there'd be a lot more debit cards on the market right now. And I know there's a lot of chatter about debit cards and this and that. You gotta distinguish between a prepaid card where you sell your Bitcoins and load the card and a true debit card that is connected to your Bitcoin wallet and when you swipe, the Bitcoin is deducted. That's what we had to build here with our, with our program manager, with our card partner. And basically we still had the same three seconds to work with, you know, but we added this entire another layer of approvals and processes next to it. So we launched a, a beta. Oh, sorry. It's not just the, uh, this, this slide is just to point out that the debit card is not just about the technical challenges. There's a whole host of other stuff that we've got now a lot of <coughs> scars on our back from um, in running this program. Uh, it's vast and really if you're going to run a debit card program, you got to make sure you have the resources internally to handle it or forget it, you know. So we launched publicly in July. You know, I do some things differently than what we did in that launch and really it was my responsibility. There was some miscommunication. We, we found out, also not, my, not our fault, but we found out at the last minute we couldn't ship to the US, which was a shock. Um, but it's going very well now. We're in 90 countries. Activities very typical of, of normal debit card usage. Um, we're adding more currencies based on demand because 
the currency in which you receive the debit card really matters because if you're spending it in <clears throat> a different currency, you get charged a currency conversion fee, and that, that sucks. Um, rolling out more features. It's globally accepted on the Visa network. Uh, use it, I withdrew 100 bucks last night in Miami from it, ATM withdrawals, no problem. It's chip and pin, magnetic stripe, so it works everywhere. We're really proud of it, um, but we're still in beta, so we haven't rolled it out completely. We're looking for a bank sponsor in the U.S. so we can ship it to our customers in the U.S., and we're getting closer. Um, there's a huge backlog of demand for it. Um, but, you know, despite all this, it's cool and everything. We're happy, but that's still the future, right? This is just the debit card is a hybrid bridge to this. Um, someday, just like... No one's carrying around DVD, well, some people are. No one's really carrying around DVDs and DVD players anymore. Um, no one's going to brick and mortar stores. They're just, I'm opening up my, my laptop and streaming on Netflix. There's not gonna be any plastic card. I'm not gonna go to a brick and mortar bank. Um, but it's gonna be a long time before it is purely digital, but it's coming. So, okay, quickly final thoughts. This has been an interesting conference because I was at this conference a year ago and uh, man, I came out jazzed from that conference. I was just, I'd, I'd gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole thanks to our CEO, Wences Cazares. Um, he, he caused an abrupt shift in my professional life with his pouring of the Kool-Aid of Bitcoin. Um, and this was, the, this was the first conference that I've been to. And man, it was just an eclectic group. It was like, to outliers everywhere and, and eccentrics everywhere and, and rah, rah. And this, this year we're a lot more subdued, right? It's not a bad thing, but we're kind of like, okay, now we got to get serious and do the work, and that's cool. Um, but I do want to – the whole price thing is, is a double-edged sword. When it's going up, everybody overestimates how great things are, and when it's going down, they, they do the same thing. So – I'm not worried at all, and I'm not worried because I think we've got the answer right now. I'm not worried because if you give me the why, I'll figure out the how. And what we're here, we're trying to figure out the how, but we will because we have the why. We have the purpose. We all got into this, I think, for, for reasons that, that involve more than just making money. You know, Bitcoin represents, Bitcoin represents autonomy, financial autonomy, it represents democratization of money so that people, 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion people can have access to the financial services that we take for granted, right? And it represents unity, not in some, look, I'm basically a libertarian, so I'm not using these trite flowery terms easily, but unity, human unity. Money is a language, right? And Bitcoin is a universal language. Money is a language used to communicate about value. And this is the first universal language anybody with a cell phone can speak. So when someone tells me that I can't send a Bitcoin, five bucks or whatever, to a farmer in Uganda, they're not saying, well, you can't send him money. They're saying you can't talk to him. You can't associate with him, right? And we all know that's unacceptable in the long term. So we have the why. We're blessed with being a part of this thing. And we'll figure it out. I'm convinced we'll figure it out. There's, an, there's two NFL ga games going on today. And I, in my past, I was a linebacker for the Redskins. Very, very backup, never got any time. But my rookie year, we won the Super Bowl. And uh, so we were in the NFC Championship game. Championship games are going on today. And I was, I was as grandiose as a 21-year-old on a team that's going to win the Super Bowl could be, right? Which is extremely grandiose. Um, even though I was a scrub. Okay. Um, and I thought what we were doing was very important because a lot of people were giving it attention. But what's going on in Seattle today, what's going on in the other game today, is very interesting, it's fun, it's entertainment, but it's not important. What's going on here is important, right, with 200 people here. This, this is important, what we're doing. Even though the world doesn't know it, to recognize that this is important, right? So to, our, to the critics, to, to the supporters, to everybody, nothing has changed from last year except the tone and our willingness to, to do the work. Um, and the, the message for me is still the same, which is to the moon, you know? 
to the effing moon. Thanks.